teaching on the subject of faith cometh. 20 ways that faith comes. Actually, there's more ways than that. There's, it's, it's like a mighty river with many little bit of uh, tributaries coming in, little streams, rivers coming in, but it's like a mighty river. And it's very important. We're actually going into number 15, the 15th way that faith comes. Now, I will say this as we look at Psalms 91 tonight, uh, that is going to sound a little bit similar to what we taught last night. Last night we were teaching that faith comes through the partaking of the Passover lamb, eating his flesh and drinking his blood. But this is totally different. Because, I'm going to tell you the reason why. Because when you eat the flesh and drink the blood of Jesus, it is a violent faith. It is an aggressive faith. I mean, you're taking a hold. You're eating. You're drinking. You're, 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 you're just, you know... It's just, it's, 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 it's almost brutal. I mean, you are devouring Christ. You are eating Christ. Now, literally what we're going to be talking about tonight is the 15th way that faith comes is through dwelling and abiding. And I just want to say that up front right now. We're going to show you this, dwelling and abiding. And actually, I'm going to show you in Psalms 91 that it is literally more of a context of intimacy and love. That as we love on Christ, as we have intimacy with Christ, as we come into oneness with Christ, that faith will begin to come to us in a marvelous, awesome way. Now, why would we be emphasizing the apprehending, the taking a hold of, the growing, the developing, the increasing of faith? Because really, everything that we have, everything that we partake of in Christ has to be done by faith. Faith is a realm. Faith is a dimension. Faith is a place. There's a place called faith. And we understand that all things were created by faith because God had faith in himself. Now, we are those who have no confidence in the flesh. We don't trust in ourselves, but we trust in God. Uh, it says, commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And so we must have faith. And we know that Jesus said at the very end of the ages, when he came back, would there be any faith left? And the kind of faith that we're talking about is a faith that apprehends the character, the nature, the mind, the heart, the will of God. It takes a hold of Jesus Christ and brings you into a place of victory over sin, obedience to God, slaying, subduing, overcoming the flesh. So this is the kind of faith that we need to have. And you can have that kind of faith. It's just like your muscles in your body. You know, a lot of people, let's face it, that the natural illustrates the spiritual. So as you look at the natural, and most of Americans are out of shape, physically out of shape, we do, we do not have any less of the muscles than what our, our predecessors had. Our parents, our great parents, and our great great grandparents. Yet, if you could back up a generation, I mean, I remember as a little boy growing up, it was very seldom I met people who were out of shape. But now most people are physically out of shape. You know what that is? It's symbolic of spiritually. Most people are spiritually out of shape because they're not exercising the muscle called faith. We need to exercise our muscle called faith. Now, bodily exercise, it profiteth little. It is profitable, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Now, if you don't want to develop your physical muscles, if you don't want to get in physical condition because you don't really think it's important, you don't think it's vital, you don't think it really matters, well, then, you know, that's the way it's going to be. But I'll tell you what, you're going to pay for the price later on, are you not? Let me also tell you that if you are going to have problems, and a lot of our problems today in America is because we are physically out of shape. We're eating the wrong things. We're doing the wrong things. We're not exercising. We're not getting up. We're not moving around. A lot of people are couch potatoes. Well, physically, America is a disaster. It really is. I've been to other countries, and, and, and when I go to the Philippines, I'll tell you what, you very seldom meet anybody who's not, who, who's not in shape. I mean, that's honest. Now, it's been about 20 years since I've been there, so it could have changed. I mean, a lot of things changed. I heard the other day that a lot, a lot of people from Mexico now are really getting out of shape. And when I was in Mexico years ago, everybody was as skinny as a bean pole. But I guess now they're extremely overweight, and they're totally out of shape. Why? Because they're not exercising. Well, let me tell you something. If you think the physical man has having problems, whoa, when you take a look at the spiritual man. Faith is almost non-existent in the modern-day church. 
I'm talking about a faith that takes a hold of healing, takes a hold of peace, takes a hold of joy, takes a hold of victory over the flesh that crucifies the old man. Well, that's what we're here for. We want to help you to develop your faith. You might consider this a spiritual exercise class because faith is a muscle. Say a muscle. You know, it's just like the brain. Did you know to some extent the brain is a muscle? And if you don't use it, you lose it. You know, I read the other day back, back in the 40s that the average vocabulary of, an of, of a child in elementary school was like 25,000 words. And, 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 and they said it's, it's probably not even 10,000 words anymore. It's probably not even 10,000 words. So from 1945, 25,000. See, we're not smarter than the other generations. We're not more intelligent. We're stupid. We're, we're worse, you know. But you know what? It's the same thing with faith. We need to see people begin to rise up in faith, go after the will of God, because that's what faith does. You know why people don't pray no more? Do you know why people don't read their Bible? Do you know why people can't forgive? Do you know why people don't have joy, don't have peace? Do you know why people are so sickly in the church? In the church, you know, in the book of James, it says, if there is any sick among you, did you notice that? James said to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, if there is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. Now we say, is there anybody who's not sick? So something's wrong. Say something's wrong. And it, our, the problem is our faith. We've lost our faith in Christ. In, in America, has lost its way, hasn't it? Well, take a look what it says here in Psalms 91. Now, I really want to read Psalms 91 to you. And uh, Tom isn't going to probably permit me to get into this the way I really need to, but look what it says here. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, say I. I. He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him will I trust. So notice this whole Psalms 91 is built on the first two verses. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler, that's talking about God, and from the noisome pestilence. He, God, shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wing shall thou trust his truth. His truth comes, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. You could actually, the truth is Jesus. He shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shall not be afraid. Say, I'll not be afraid. See, God hasn't given me a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. So where there's faith, there is no fear Amen. of what men will do to you. Amen. Of sickness or disease or poverty or financial lack or plagues or afflictions. There is no fear. There is no worry. There is no torment. How can I tell if I'm in faith, Pastor Mike? Because you'll have peace that passes understanding. Joy unspeakable. When you're in that realm of faith, you're doing good. You know, I'm, I'm so glad that there's ways that we can tell if we're not in faith. It's just like when somebody is sick, you can put their hands on their forehead and see if they run the fever. The doctor will have you open your mouth and go, ah, and he can look at your tonsils or your tongue or whatever else. So the physical body tells you when things aren't right. Your attitude, your actions, your words reveal to you if you're in faith. Now, it's not really for you to look at somebody to be critical of them, but you can help them if you can. See, I want to help people come into faith. I need help to come into faith. Hello? I'll not turn down help. I remember as a young Christian, I attached myself to some men who were strong in faith. Lester Sumrall, Kenneth Hagin, a guy by the name of Albert Willis, Dr. Clifford Rice, and all of these men were probably at least 30 years older than me, close to it. And you know what? They helped me. They helped me because I, I had to go looking for men of faith because I couldn't find anybody. I, I knew a lot of preachers, but I didn't know a lot of men of faith. I needed somebody because remember, one way that faith comes is association. Amen. How many want to catch a good case of faith? Come on, man. Woo! I want to catch a good case of faith. And it says, yes, and it says, thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. That, that's okay. If you hear somebody howling in the background, that's somebody who's got their snoot full of Jesus. Yes. 
nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasted at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy, what? Habitation, Habitation your dwelling place. I mean, you're right at home in Jesus, man. He's, you're living in him. You're dwelling in him. You're abiding in him. And so he's not only, not only is your habitation, but he's also the table set before you in the presence of your enemies. He's also the lamb that you eat. So not only is he your housing, but he is your food. He's your victuals. He's your drink. You drink his blood. There shall no evil, there shall no evil there shall no evil befall thee. Uh, uh, and, and of course, when they came out of Israel, he said, I will put none of these diseases upon thee. He says, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give, God will give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon, shalt thou trample under feet. That's talking about demonic powers. Jesus said, Behold, I give unto you all power to tread upon serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall have any, any means come to harm you. And then it tells us in Ephesians chapter 1 that he has put all things under his feet. See, under he's the head of the body. He's put all demonic powers under his feet. So go ahead and step on the devil for a moment. Just... Cause him a little bit of pain. Amen? Amen. And uh, because, Amen. verse 14, now listen, remember I told you it's more than eating and drinking. I said the abiding and the dwelling is based upon love. And here it is in verse 14. God said this, because he has set his love upon me, because he has set his love upon me, that's you, me, the writer of the book of, uh, of, 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 of Psalms 91, now, we're not exactly sure who wrote Psalms 91. Psalms 90 literally came from Moses. As a matter of fact, keep your finger there and just look in Psalms 90, verse 1, for a moment. Listen to what Moses said here. Look there in, chapter nine, in, in Psalms 90, verse 1. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Amen. You're our dwelling place. In you, we live and move and have our being. You are our life, yes. you're our fortress. You're our high tower that we run into in a time of trouble. You're our shield. You're our buckler. You're the horn of our salvation. You're our victory. You're our everything. So this is so important that we understand these things. Because in, in verse 14 of chapter 91, because you have set your love upon me, God says, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. Now, I know prophetically this is speaking about Christ, but this is for every believer. Amen. This is for every believer. Amen. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. Yes. You know, that's why the Bible says in Psalms 23, verse 5, it says, uh, when you pray, believe that you receive and you shall have. Uh, you got to believe he that comes to God must believe that he is and he's a reward of them that diligently seek him. So I've got to, pr when, I, when we get together to pray in the morning at 6 o'clock and we pray through the whole day and we pray without ceasing in our heart and our mind and our emotions and attitude, you got you to gotta believe that God's hearing your prayers. You, you got, not because of the amount of words you're praying. You just you got to believe it. That, that's faith. Faith says, Father, I thank you. Jesus said, Father, I thank you that you hear me always. Yes. Say, Father, you hear me always. Yes, Lord. Okay, I will be with him in trouble. Now, did you notice it didn't say you're not going to have trouble? Though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. We're going to be in trouble. Many of the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. If I never had a trial, if I never had a problem, I'd never have victory. Amen. I'd never have a story to tell. I'd never have a testimony. Uh, it says we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of heaven. Say, I'm a tribulating. <laughs> we must through much tribulation. That's like saying, I want to have a baby with no contractions. No, you, you got to have contractions, ladies. <laughs> you can cover up your ears, but if you get pregnant, you're going to have a baby. 
You're going to have contractions. I will be with him in, in trouble. I will deliver him. That's the good news. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. Will I satisfy him and show him my salvation? Now, when you get a chance, take Psalms 91 and highlight every time he refers to to you in a very personal way. Matter of fact, let me just, just read some of these real quick. He, I, my, thee, thou, thy, thine, he, his, him. It's amazing. In 16 verses where it refers to you or me or the writer of Psalms 91, 41 times. Oh, do you think this is personal? Think this is intimate? Amen. Think this is between you and God? Yes. Now the writer of Psalms, he says, my God has become your God, and what God has done for me, he'll do for you, so make it personal. 41 times. And then it refers to God, where God speaks of himself as the Most High, the Almighty, the Lord, he, refuge, fortress, God, him, his, my, and goes on and on over 25 times. Now, why would it emphasize us more than God? I'm going to tell you the reason why. Because God ain't the problem. Amen. Draw nigh to me. He said, draw nigh to me. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. For in other words, wait a minute. Are you abiding in me? Are you dwelling in me? Or are you being double-minded? I mean, you can't serve God and mammon. Right. See, faith will come. Say, faith will come. Faith will grow, faith will increase, faith will explode if you will dwell and abide in Christ. In God, if you will dwell and abide in God, it will come. Look, look just now, now who is it that's going to abide and dwell in Christ? Well, keep your finger here and look there in Psalms 27. Psalms 27. And... If we begin in verse 1, I'll, I'll do that as you're looking for it. Psalms 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light. Notice, once again, as you read Psalms, it goes on and on. Did I just lose my volume? Hello? It's okay? Okay. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the light, strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Notice, my, 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 through all the Psalms. It's very personal. And many of these were written by David. When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though a host should encamp against me, I will not fear. Though war should rise up against me, in this I will be confident. What? Now watch, it almost seems like he's going to switch to a different subject here. Look what it says in verse 4. One thing have I desired of the Lord. In the midst of all these afflictions, in the midst of all these attacks, in the midst of all this threat, in the midst of all these enemies, notice what he says. This one thing I desired of the Lord. That will I seek after. Listen, he's not seeking a way to defeat the enemy. He's not strategizing. He's not calling a war council. He's not walking the floor, worrying. Notice, this one thing I will do when I'm being attacked by my enemy. This is profound, guys. This is faith. This one thing I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. See, now you understand, David, David's the one who danced before the Lord with all of his might when they brought the Ark of the Covenant in. Remember that? They brought the Ark of the Covenant. He danced before the Lord. Why? He wanted to build the temple. Matter of fact, his son Solomon didn't really have to do that much because David had drawn up all the plants, all the blueprints, all and specifically, and then he had gathered much of the wood, much of the gold, much of the silver, much of the rocks, much of the stones, all of the building materials. David had been doing that. Why? Because this was the cry of his heart. I want to be in the presence of God. I want to stand in the temple of God. I want to dwell in the house of, the God, of God. I want to be where God's at. I want to walk with God. 
I want to walk with God. That's one reason he went up and got the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the first time he brought it down, they put it on a brand new cart being pulled by oxen, and that was against the word of God. See, even though David had a heart after God, he did, it again. He, he, he did not read the word of God. So you can be sincere in your heart and wrong in your head. And when the ark began to fall off of this cart, there was a man who reached up and touched the ark of the covenant. He fell down dead. Well, David got so full of fear that he took the ark and he put it in a man's house that was right there where the accident happened. And the Bible says that man's house prospered. So he, he said, man, I can't have that. So he went up there and he got the ark. Listen, wherever God's presence is, you will prosper. So if you are dwelling and abiding in Christ, his word is dwelling and abiding you, no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Now, I believe the major problem in, our, our, in our, the modern day church is that we're very double-minded, we're double standard, we're not really seeking God the way we should, we're not really being aggressive, we're not really eating and drinking. We are just kind of like out there on the outer fringes, kind of like, a, and you know what I mean? A lot of Christians are living in the twilight zone. They're out there in the outer limits. Oh, God, where are you? Next thing, they're watching soap puffs. Oh, God, where are you? Next thing, they're sitting in front of the TV set and they're shouting with Bill O'Reilly. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. No wonder we're not having a move of God. We're not dwelling and abiding in Christ. You know, it would almost be like, it'd be like you have, you're going to cook turkey, Nancy, for Thanksgiving. You set the oven to 200 degrees. That's not hot enough. You shove it in for 10 minutes, and you pull it out for two days. You shove it in for 15, 15 minutes, and you pull it out for three hours. Now, I know you, you wouldn't do something stupid like that, but you know that's what we do. We come to church Sunday morning, and just when the heat gets turned up a little bit, we say, whoa, I'm glad I don't have to get back in that oven for another week. Maybe two weeks, maybe three weeks. We're not, we're not, we're not abiding. We're not dwelling. Therefore, we're not being cooked. We're not being marinated. We're not being saturated with faith. Amen. With faith. We're not being filled with faith because faith comes when you dwell and you abide. Stop and think about this just for a moment. He told those men that as he was going along, Jesus, after he came out of the wilderness, he began his earthly ministry in the Holy Ghost. He told those men, he said, follow me. Those men lived with Jesus for the next three and a half years. Do you know they laid their heads right down next to him for the next three and a half years? Now, y'all ain't coming over my house and sleeping in my house because I'm not Jesus, okay? But you guys can, we need to sleep with Jesus. We need to eat with Jesus. We need to sing with Jesus. We need to fellowship with Jesus. They did it for 24 hours a day. Now, there was times Jesus went up and got alone. And there was times he took, what, Peter, James, and John, because he was, he was, he was cultivating them and discipling them to be leaders in the church, to be over the other disciples, to be over the rest of the body. But I'm telling you, man, you need to abide and you need to dwell in Christ and the devil's going to do everything he can to get your mind fractured. Get over here, over there. Now, don't misunderstand. You can work and still dwell and abide in Christ. You can do it. Say, I can do it. And so we could read the rest of that. But, but matter of fact, look there what happens in verse 7 in this particular Psalms. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lift up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Now, this is in Psalms 24. I got to take you to Psalms 24. Psalms 24. And we're talking about dwelling and abiding in Christ. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. So now we're talking about the king of glory coming in. He says, oh, lift up your heads in verse 9, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory, Shelah. Now, I want you to notice when the king of glory is going to come and abide and dwell with you. In verse 3, 
who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? Now say, who, who? Now, if you'll study, listen, the word who is used in the Bible over 500 times. It's a very interesting study. If you'll study the word who, you'll discover many times he's talking about who it is that would be blessed, who it is that will hear from heaven, who it is that will be used of God, who it is that will dwell with him, who it is that will inhabit with him. And the, the, the wisdom books, the wisdom books are Job, Psalms, uh, uh, Proverbs. And the wisdom books is over 150 times it talks about who. And it's very specific. So look what it says there. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. What do you mean clean hands? That means your hands are being used for, for what's right. You're not using your hands to shed innocent blood, to steal, to do damage to people. And a pure heart, remember it says in, in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, uh, the pure in heart, they shall see God. What? You're going to be in this house. You're going to see God. How does faith come? Dwelling and abiding. It says, who have not lifted up his soul unto vanity. Oh, this is so important, people. If you study this in Hebrew, it means you're not going after stupid things. Amen. Who's going to dwell? Who's going to abide? Well, I'm dwelling in God. I'm abiding in God. Are you going after stupid stuff? You're going after stupid stuff. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't really mean anything. Come on, if we're going to abide and dwell, we've got to stop looking at stupid stuff and going after stupid stuff. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying you can't spend time with your family. You can't go out and do things with them. But you can keep Christ in your heart. Keep Christ in your mind. Keep Christ as the center of your conversation. I, I know I, I like to go for hikes. I, I like to go out and do certain things. And, but I'm enjoying myself as I'm looking into the blue sky and I'm looking at the green trees and I'm looking at, uh, at nature. And I, I'm just, my heart is filled with thanksgiving. I, I believe many times when Jesus went up into the mountains, and we're going to talk about that, who will ascend onto the mountains on high? So then it says here, nor sworn defeats deceitfully. What that means is you, you don't, you're not making a promise with, with evil intentions. For instance, the Bible says, I know sometimes people run into a financial situation, they can't pay their bills. And the Bible says that that's what, that, 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 but, but it says that if a man borrows money with no intention of paying it back, God says that's wicked. So if you borrow money with no intention of paying it back, you're a thief. But there are people who have borrowed money and, they, and, and everything was going okay, was doing hunkadori, and then the economy went belly up or they lost their job or something. And matter of fact, there was a man who came to the king who owed him quite a 10,000 pounds and he said, oh king, I, I, I've had a bad year, give me a little bit of time and I'll pay you back. And the, and the Bible says the king forgave him all of his debt. Aren't you glad that God forgives us our debt? Amen. Oh man. Okay, it says, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, Shelah. And actually another translation says uh, that, he does, uh, that, that they are those who go after God with a pure heart. This is that generation that have made up their mind, God, I am going to go after your heart. Lord, I'm going after your will. You know, is there anything else really that matters? Back up to Psalms 15, and we'll get back to Psalms 91. Look what it says here in verse 1. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? And who, and who, say who? Who, who? <laughs> who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy holy hill 
the word hill there in the Hebrew, it literally means mountain. Remember, Moses went up to the mountain to get the commandments of God. That's where the fire of God was burning. Remember, Jesus went up onto the Mount of Transfiguration, and Moses and Elijah showed up. There's something about going up into the mountains. Maybe that's why a lot of times guys want to go up into the mountains. I don't know. But there's something up there in the mountains, man. It's just, you know, I know that physical height isn't going to help you. Maybe it's just the fact that you're getting all alone with God. You know, you need to get alone with God. You need to get into your prayer closet. Yes, we need to gather, and we come to pray. But let me tell you something. My gathering together with the guys to pray or the people to pray is a, is a small tip of my iceberg of getting alone with God. I get alone with God many times through the day. I just get alone with God. It might be in my office, and sometimes even in my front room, I'm just sitting there and I'm meditating. I'm talking to the Lord. Many, many times as my children were, being, were, were sleeping in bed and my wife was in bed many, many times, more times than I can count, I was up at 3 o'clock and 5 o'clock every morning almost. Just alone, alone, talking to God. Him talking to me most times. Him speaking to me most times in my heart. You got to get alone with God. And so he, who's going to go up to this place? And what's up on the mountain? Transfiguration. Who's going to climb up the mountain of transfiguration? What is transfiguration? It's through abiding and dwelling with him. He that hath clean hands, correct? He, he that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in whose heart? In his heart. You're honest with yourself. You know, a lot of people can't be honest with themselves. They won't admit they're the problem. How many, would have, how many of you would admit you're the problem? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, huh. Woo. <laughs> I love it. He that, he that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor e doth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, gossips against him, trying to connive against him, in whose eyes a vile person is contempt. And what that means in the Hebrew, it says that you don't justify the wicked. You know, we got people justifying certain people they like in political offices. He says, you can't abide and you can't dwell in the presence of God if you justify wickedness, if you justify the wicked doer. Matter of fact, the Bible says if you justify the covetous, you cannot abide and dwell in his presence. You know how many people are justifying the covetous? I mean, they're justifying people who are using the gospel. They're not eating corn they're eating caviar. Remember it says, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. The what? The what? The corn, not the caviar. Hello? In whose eyes a vile person is kept him, but he honoreth them that feareth the Lord, that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. Let me say this. It says, Swear not, neither by heaven, neither by earth, neither by other, any other oath, but let your yea be yea, your nay nay. Be very slow to make promises. Be very slow, especially because you might find out that you should have checked with God first, and now you made a commitment that God says, I didn't tell you to do that. I didn't tell you to make that commitment. And that's why it says, rather we should say, if the Lord is willing, if the Lord is willing, I'll live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boasting. All such rejoicing is evil. So, so don't, don't watch, watch it when it comes. People say, Pastor Mike, can you, can, can you do me a favor? I never say, well, sure I can, because I don't know what they're going to ask me to do. I say, tell me, talk to me. And 90% of the time, I tell them, nope, I can't do it. I, I'm sorry, I can't do that. So, and, and sometimes... You can make a commitment in your heart to do something, but don't verbally make it. Because maybe in the midst of it, you'll find out that God will tell you, I wasn't in this. That's why I've gone to conferences, and they try to get people to make a commitment for a certain amount of money every month. I know we're asking people to pray about making a commitment, but guess what? We're not asking you actually, if you're going to give $100 a month to, this car, to, 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 to the network, listen, we're not sending you a promise paper to sign or nothing else. That's just between you and God because, listen, man, you're committed to Jesus Christ. You understand? I want to help you get into the place where you're dwelling and abiding in Jesus Christ and you ain't got all this Mickey Mouse luggage on your back 
where you're trying to keep commitments that God never put you up to, but somebody got you to make a commitment that God never did. Now, don't misunderstand me. That doesn't mean you should never be committed. I'm just saying you better watch what you swear you're going to do. You just you need to use a lot of wisdom. And I still, I still cry out to God. I've made commitments and I couldn't keep them. I said, God, forgive me. And he spoke to my heart and said, you should have never made it. That doesn't mean you don't keep commitments. That doesn't mean that you don't go, go out of your way to do God's will. It just means you really need to hear from heaven. Well, let's go back to Psalms 91. We could stay there, but we don't have time. Go back to Psalms 91 because I want us to get to John chapter 15. So I want you to notice that it begins to talk about what God will do for you, how God responds to you, how God's going to move on your behalf, how God's going to protect you with his angels. He's going to keep you from plagues, from disease, from disaster. You're going to be abiding under his feathers like the chicks underneath the wings of a, of a mother hen if you put your trust in him. And it tells us why in verse 14, because, say because. because. See now, but you, what you don't love to do, you cannot abide and dwell in. You know, I, I've never understood. I, I actually remember as a little boy, I'd stay home sometimes because I, I had all kinds of physical problems. My mom would go to work. I'd turn on. We had an old black and white TV. I mean, that's all they had in those days. We didn't have color TV. I didn't have color TV until I moved out of my house. It, it's hard to believe that it was, you know, wasn't that long ago. But I'd turn on the TV, and they'd have a, a general hospital or as the world turns or something like that. I'd turn it on as a little boy, and I'd start watching general hospital. And I would go, these people are sick. Now, we're talking back 30 years ago. No, not 30, 50. We're talking, I'm 57 now, so I was probably about 7, 8 years old. I'd watch these people, man. I couldn't believe how stupid they were. As a little boy, I, I couldn't believe how, but you know what you can't believe? I know people, I know people who have been watching General Hospital since they were little girls up to now for over 50-some years. Why would they abide in it? Why would they? It takes a month for anything to happen, at least back then. I don't know what it is today. I think, I think 10 programs was one day in the life of as the stomach turns. But they would abide in it, and they would dwell in it, and they would devour it, and they would go, and they would get together, and the ladies would drink coffee and discuss how Sam was now with, with, with Juliana, and Juliana was cheating with, with, with on Sam with, with, with Freddie the doctor. Sick stuff, man. And, and the housewives would come over to my mom's house. Now, our house, now my mom didn't watch that much of it, but the ladies would uh, coffee clutch it, and they'd sit around Saturday morning and be talking about all, what, what, what happened all week long in a stupid soap opera. They were a part of it. They were abiding in it. No wonder now we have, somebody told me the other day, that locally 85, over in the Littlestown area, 85% of the children going to public school are living in single parent homes. Whoa, what is that? It's the soap operas. They were abiding in it. They were dwelling in it. It got inside of them. It destroyed them. So we've got to abide and we've got to dwell in Jesus. But what you love is what you're going to do. You better develop, see, faith, you better develop a love for Jesus Christ. Amen. You better, you know, a lot of people love to complain. They love to gripe. They love to find fault. There's people who love to put other people down. I mean, there's people who love all kinds of stupid stuff. You know what I'm saying? We better, says, because you love me. You set your love upon me. Because you said, I will love you with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind and all my strength. Because you said, I will love me. For in words, you could have took your love and poured it into anything. Your emotions, your mind, your life. What you love is what you pour your money into. But because you put your love upon me, therefore I will deliver you. I will set you on high because you have known my name. For instance, you can't know his name if you don't decide to love him. You got to abide in him. You got to dwell in him. Listen, he says, he shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I don't understand why God's not with me in my trouble. Well, it could be because you haven't set your heart on him. You're just trying to use them like a crutch or you're trying to use them, you know, as a band-aid when you get cut. You don't really care about him. Remember the ten, spot, the ten lepers? God, Jesus healed them. Only one came back and fell at his feet. 
Go, go to uh, John now, John 15. How does faith come? This is a major way that faith comes. When you abide and dwell in Christ. You've got to abide and dwell in Christ. You've got to set your heart upon him. Jesus said some amazing things in John 15. John 14, 15, 16. Seven, and, and he's talking to his disciples. Then John 17, he goes into this mode. I just love it. I just, it's so amazing because now, because we know what he's been talking to his father about up in the mountains all those years. All of a sudden in John 17, he takes us into the prayer closet with him and we hear him talking to his daddy. Oh, and he said, oh, daddy, thank you for these people you've given me. Lord, I've given them the word that you gave me. Now, Father, as the glory you gave me before, the glory I had with you before I came to their earth, that now I'm going to get back. He said, let them have that glory. Notice, his prayer was always to the Father for us. Amen. He ever liveth to make intercession for us. Amen. So he's praying to them, and he says, Father, that they may be one with us, even as we are one, yes. Yes. that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and thou hast loved them, even as thou hast loved me. Yes. And so he said, the glory you gave me, I've given to them. He said, I don't pray that you take them out of the world, but you keep them in the world. And then he says in John 15, verse 1, and he's trying to get us ready to become one with them. I am the true vine. I am the vine, like a grape vine. And that was very, in that society, that was very important, the grape vines, because remember, it was the land that flowed with it. Remember the first thing they carried when they came out of the land of promise? They carried a, it took two men to carry a cluster, a cluster of grapes. Wow. Man, there must have been some big grape vines. Wow. A cluster of grapes between two men. woo -hoo. I don't know if them grapes were the size of melons or not. I don't know, man. But it was some high-bred grapes. He said, I am the true vine, and my father's the husband, he's the cultivator, he's the, he's, he's the, it's his vineyard. Every branch, say every branch. every branch. In me that beareth not fruit, he's going to take it away. What fruit? The fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace. This is all apprehended by faith. Amen. The divine nature. Love, joy, peace. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness faithfulness, commitment, you know, holiness, obedience, forgiveness. I mean, the fruits of righteousness. It says if you don't have fruit, God said, and these are branches. These are branches. We're not talking about thorns and thistles and weeds. We're talking about those connected to Jesus. Yeah. He said, you don't produce fruit. My daddy's cutting you off. Why would he cut you off? Because you're just going to be a drain on the body. You're just going to suck the... Have you ever got around people who spiritually just sucked you dry? Just like we used to call them egg-sucking dogs on the farm. We used to have dogs. They would, know, they would go into the chicken house to sneak. They didn't eat the chickens. They'd take their teeth and they'd bust the eggs and eat the eggs. Suck them right up. And you'd have to... Okay, which dog's sucking the eggs? And I'm telling, you, I'm telling you honestly what they would do. I'm, back in them days, that farmer, when he found that egg-sucking dog, it don't care, he don't care if it was the family pet. He'd take that dog out behind the woodshed, and you, hear, you would hear a bang! And that was the end of that egg-sucking dog. You know why? What, because he was eating all of your harvest. He says, if you are an, a, just a sap-sucking vine... You're not producing fruit, and it's your fault because you don't really care. God is going to cut you off. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, it's going to take it away. And every branch that beareth fruit, you got some joy, you got some peace, you got some patience, you got some kindness, you got some long suffering, you got some love for God, you're hungering after God, you're abiding after God, you're really wanting to grow in God. He's going to purge you that it may bring forth more fruit. How does he do it? By the word, verse 3. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you, the words of Christ. Abide in me, dwell in me, love me. Let me be your every thought, let me be your every desire, let me be everything to you. 
and I in you, and I'm going to be in you. If you'll think about me and dwell on me and love me, I will be in you because he lives in us by faith. Christ draws in us by faith. As the branch cannot, say the branch cannot, bear fruit of itself. I've heard people say, you know, Pastor Mike, when I, get right, when I get right in my heart, I'll come back with God. I said, you'll never get right without God. Amen. He's the life. I can't make it without Jesus. You can't get your stuff together without Jesus. You need him. Amen. Get this in your heart. Stop looking at other people. Well, how come they don't get their stuff together? No, don't you worry about them getting their stuff together. You get your stuff together. You pull the beam out of your own eyes. Now, listen, I'm going to really be telling this. I'm going to tell this body right now. I'm going to start preaching a Sunday morning. There is way too much stink and strife in this church. People getting offended, people backstabbing, people getting mad, people getting upset. Enough's enough of this stuff. The Bible says, by your love for one another, you will know you are my disciples. Amen. Yell at the person across from you and say, you cannot offend me. You Yell it. Me. You cannot say, go ahead and try. No. <laughs> you cannot offend me. I don't want to see you cut off. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more, no more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth, he that dwelleth, he that liveth in me, he that liveth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Now listen, if I don't, if I, if I don't have a lot of fruit, I don't have a lot of patience, a lot of kindness, a lot of joy, a lot of peace, a lot of understanding, a lot of mercy, a lot of love. If I get upset and you get me mad, I ignore you. I walk away from you. I won't even talk to you. I'm not abiding in Jesus. So what do I do? If that pan stops running, you don't tear the motor apart. If it's unplugged from the wall. If that fan stops running, the very first thing you do, now I know that, that motor's valuable. I know that motor won't run. With, it can, the brushes can go out. The windings can go out. There's different parts of it. I was an electrician in the Navy. But if that fan stops running, guess what the first thing I'm going to do? I'm going to make sure that it's plugged into the outlet. Now, if it's plugged in the outlet, I'm going to check the circuit breaker because why isn't life coming into that fan? See, electricity is life to that fan. And as the lights in this building, the PA system, electricity is its life. If the lights ain't working, if the PA ain't working, then there's something wrong with the electrical problems or there's something wrong with the lighting system. Well, listen, let me tell you something. If you are abiding in Christ, his word is abiding in you, you will produce much fruit. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> you almost got him treed. You will produce much fruit. Amen. If I'm not producing fruit, then I'm not abiding in Christ. Amen. His word ain't abiding in me. My wife always used to love, and actually that irritated me because I wasn't plugged into Jesus like I should have been. He said, perfect peace have them that love thy law and nothing, nothing shall offend him. And every time I'd get offended or acted, you know, throw a little temper tantrum, Fill my diaper and you could smell it. She'd quote that scripture to me and I'd say, huh, the scripture. I'd, you know, I'd walk away. You know, and of course then I'd throw it back at her when something got her upset. That's not what she's point. The word of God is not like a ping pong ball. You go whack, whack, whack. Ha, oh, look at I got a good one in there. You know, it's not like you're in a boxing wing and, and, and your fist is the word of God. And you go, oh, watch this, pop. I got you a good one. Pop, I got you a good one. You know, and some guys, they're bigger than other got people, and so they can really pop the scriptures at them, you know, really beat them up. That ain't, that ain't, like I said, speaking the word in love. So well, that's not what we want to do. That's not abiding in Christ. But if you're abiding in Christ, you will produce what? You will bring forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. In verse 8, let's jump down. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, 
So shall you be my disciples, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. I, I just want you to notice, we got to abide in Jesus. Faith will come. Say, faith will come. If we dwell and abide in Christ, faith will come, and we will have much fruit. Give the Lord a hand clap and a shout. Hallelujah! <laughs> I love it, brother. <laughs> it takes me back to my childhood when we used to hunt those raccoons late at night. So you can go ahead and stop the recording. Those of you watching by... Uh, See, so you, can, you can smile.